there's no accountability for just you can pick one track that some kid's done in his bedroom, everyone can like it. You go to a venue, see him do this really hot gig live, and he's terrible most of the time. Yes. I no, think, it's not the artist's fault though, is it? Well, it's just that well everyone's no, everything's on it too, too early. early. There's yeah. a new track every day, there's you know, countless hundreds and hundreds of blogs, um, and it's just oversaturated the, the pace of it you know an album would would take a year you know t to record you know and go through the chain and everyone would get really excited about it because there were only you know a certain number of bands you know and everyone would get they, everyone would throw their lot in with this band and go all the way with it but now you just find that everyone's just scurrying around trying to find something that's cool you, you still do a lot of like like the album. People say, "Oh, the album's dead now because it's all about <coughs> finding the, the single song," and so the album is like tied to a, a, an era of physical product. Do you do you not think that? Well, I'm really old and stupid, um, and I grew up. My first ever record was out of the blue by ELO, which is double vinyl. You know, take that. Um, <laughs> and so that's the that's the way I grew up with it. Throughout the '80s, my favourite bands were U2 and The Cure and New Order and everyone else like The Smiths as well. You know, bands that had real impact on culture and bands that had real proper followings. You know, you get to that. The third album was the important album and then you can drift in and out. You might not like the fourth album, but you'll be back for the fifth album. Whereas now that, that, that doesn't really happen anymore, but I'm, too, I'm so old, I can't change, change my ways. An album is an album, it's, it's, it's a work of art. It's, it's 41 minutes of absolute joy and should have you know a fast song and a slow song and and a dippy bit and a crazy bit and it should be a little adventure and some of the some of my favorite songs of all time are only on albums and some and that's that's the that's legendary isn't it that's without albums there'd be no prog rock you know what would ken bruce play on radio too whenever ken bruce plays a, a, plays a genesis track that lasts for seven minutes every you know that the switchboard would go crazy if they still use switchboards as it is people are tweeting and my and and social networking in their droves, saying thank you very much, you know, thank you for allowing that to happen, instead of shoving more and you know another pop, crazy pop single down our gullets. Do you think it's an age thing? Do you think it's like a, a young kid who's kind of used to that one track, you know? You're a young fella, Martin. What would you yeah. say? Well, I think I think that, you know the blogs kind of have a lot to answer for when you, when you come to one track because you know as we've talked about a lot is they don't really invest anything of themselves in any of these tracks and in any of these bands they, and it doesn't and they have don't to be it doesn't have to be good either no, it just has to be cool it just has to be cool exactly you know no one invests any sort of time money they might invest a bit of energy in trying to find everything but they don't really Love it's it. Not energy. They're sitting on their asses looking at their laptops. It's not energy, is it? <laughs> they might have to run around trying Trawling to find out a Wi Fi of a spot. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, I'm exhausted. So, so I had to move out yeah. today. I'm oh, completely I've looked, out I've of the loop. I've looked at 27 by blogs today. I'm, I can't go. Oh, I'm a bit weary. Yeah. So yeah. You think the, thing, the thing about it is that when Fierce Panda did demos, what would happen was a band would form and they'd make some music and they'd be happy with four songs and then they'd put them on a cassette and they'd design the artwork for the cassette and then they'd write a letter to the record company and then they'd find where the record company actually was and then they'd have to go down to the post office and get a jiffy bag and then they'd have to go to the post office again and get a stamp. I mean, that's six months already, knowing most bands that I deal with. And then they'd send it into a record company and then we'd go down to P.O. Box and pick up a sack of mail and get about 50 demos at once and then it'd empty out the sack and then we'd open up all the jiffy bags and we'd read all the letters. By the time you've done all that, another year's passed and you've also, you're investing in the band. By the time you've done all that, you put the CD into the CD player, you think, oh, I must have listened to all three tracks, unless it's absolutely bloody rubbish. Whereas now, that's all gone. And, and from an A&R perspective, you go online and you do the bloggy thing and you listen to a track for about a minute and you go, that sounds good, must book them for a gig or try to book them for a gig, well, they're, they're probably too cool anyway, they're just playing Dalston. And then you write it down <laughs> and then you forget about the band. And so we're all, we're all to blame because we're, all our attention spans are falling by the wayside. And for the band, it's catastrophic because all they need to do now is, you know, they have to worry about the cassette they don't have to worry about the artwork or the letter or the address or anything like that. They just write a song and it gets on a blog and the world goes crazy for them. And they're not ready for it. You know, the whole point of the cassette 
PO box record company not listening to it for six months process is about that's the crucial time in a band's career that's when they learn if they actually like each other that's when they formulate their own sound I mean bear in mind that Coldplay began for like two years before we picked up on them and then they signed to Parlophone six months after we picked up on them they still hadn't written Yellow by then Look at the stars. I know everyone thinks that they were just a bunch of possos who walked into you know music industry glory but that wasn't the case whatsoever and now bands you know they, they, I mean we were talking about setting up a blog weren't we called a band of the hour and we're, <laughs> yeah. we're only half joking we're, so, you know here's a great new band by lunchtime they could be cobblers but who cares you know that's that's the attitude from so many of these people this band of the day and band of, it's just it's it's out of control yeah. and there's not we're it's not sustainable and we're you know the, it's it's like harvest over harvesting you know, we're not let allowing bands to develop. And I say this, since the whole internet boom, name me one band, one massive band that we've produced in this country. There isn't anyone. 1999, a classic, appalling year for music, by all accounts. I think I was there, but I saw I'll read a book somewhere that will give me all the memories. On the surface level, nothing was happening, but behind the scenes, we had bands like Coldplay, Doves, Elbow and Muse all doing their first gigs, all getting their first records out. So, with the benefit of hindsight, that was an incredibly important time. But now, where, where are, you know, as much as we denigrate those bands, they're the ones that have been sustaining the music industry and allowing new signings to happen for the past 10 years. It's made like a massive gap, hasn't it, between, you know, a sort of stuff on a grassroots level and then stuff on that kind of level, that whole kind of like stadium thing. There used to be a, a, a simple path, well not a simple path, but a path that you follow yeah. where, you know, Panda put your record out and then you got picked up by, by a bigger indie order and then you yeah. maybe get signed by a major, or, and, and, but there was a path and you knew how it worked. And then you've still got this massive, you know, world of stadium type rock and nobody knows how to cross that, you know, that massive gap in between there. The filter's been removed, you know, everyone's telling everyone that this is great, that is great, but really what qualifies this blogger or that blogger to tell everyone that this is great? I mean, they might love it, but at least, you know, if you're sort of a record company, you're putting your money where your mouth is and you're saying, right, we believe in this, we're going to press the records, we're going to pay PR, etc., we're going to really try and get it out there, we love this, and you're vouching for it. Whereas no one's, no one's doing anything like that. They're just like, yeah, it's great. Oh, well, actually, maybe it's not so great. But they never, they never come back and write a letter of apology, do they? And say, actually, I've thought about it. And that track I put up on Tuesday, it's really not that good. I'm really sorry. Forget about that. Please don't stop following my blog. Some of my, I'll find something good, I promise. Some of my favourite bloggers, you know, you, you talk to these people and they, you know, they're raving about a band on a Monday. And they say, and there's going to be a gig tomorrow night. Everyone's going to be there. And you think, oh, well, maybe I should go to that gig. And then, no, I'd like to mess up his blog because I'm not going to go. So not everyone's going to be there because I'm going to go home instead. And then, you know, in the, it, just keeping up, keeping tabs on it. And then on the Wednesday, you say to the blogger, how was the gig? Did you go? Yeah, it was rubbish. That's it. That band is never mentioned ever again. Dead. So that's 48 hours, a, a cycle yeah. of 48 hours. Yeah. And if you don't crack it in that 48 hours, then you've got no career. So you have to slink off back to Dawson, change your name, start all over again. The bands aren't ready. That's the key to it. And it's incredibly hard to hold off because it's not because, you know, once you put anything out there, then it's in the public domain. So if you just set up a SoundCloud thing, it's not like you're employing a PR and a plugger and all this and getting, you know, going the blah, blah, blah. In fact, that's probably quite, it doesn't work like that, does it? Because the great thing about bloggers is that they're incredibly principled. And I know that because when we try and, you know, shove fierce panda stuff their way, they're kind of, what's this? This is kind of, you know, this is, this is, got, this is a finished record. I'm not going to write about it. This is an album. How can I write about this? This is new and sexy. So I really admire them for that. You know, and they're a great source of information. And a lot of the bands are really good, but they're not good enough for the amount of attention they're getting. Because it's not like, okay, we're not ready, we're not gonna play any gigs. It's too late, your video is on there and everyone's talking about it. That's the problem. I used to think that um, with MySpace, I got, I got the impression that a lot of bands thought they only needed to write four songs because that's all was on MySpace. Again, they didn't know what an album was. They'd never bought a CD single. They thought, well, that's, that's obviously all you need. When they saw the contract from Club Fandango, politely, you know, informing them they'd need to play for 30 minutes. They'll be like, oh, I don't think we're quite ready. I think we need to go and rehearse. We're going to go and write two more songs. Um, and it's the same nowadays. You know, people just think they need to see one good song to get a record deal. And 
to a certain point, they're absolutely right. But beyond that, you know, there, there's no foundation to it. And there's no, and they're not doing the tours either. Even someone like Woo Life, you know, they've got a tremendous reputation and they've got, obviously got a really good following. I noticed they're doing two nights of heaven next month. But Oasis did like 35 day tours. They went everywhere. They went to Buxton. They went to Derby. They went back to Buxton, back to Derby. They probably, it's probably the same bloody place. I don't know. But, you know, they went right around the country. They, they grew it from, you know, they didn't suddenly explode. The same with Colpay. They went on like four or five tours. You know, it's, it's, it, these things don't suddenly happen overnight. Um, you know, Elbow were the greatest example of an overnight sensation. You know, it took them like four albums before people sort of finally started paying any attention. By which point they were pretty good. They knew what they were doing in interviews. They could, he could sing quite well. You know, they could bang, bash out a tune or whatever. And they had a really good, good fan base. Um, and it, I mean, I'd throw Snow Patrol into the, you know, I think they, they, they're doing, they stole, they, they've just done they? three nights at the O2. Why isn't this band on the front of the enemy? Yeah, because we've, we've lost everything. We've lost, we've lost absolutely everything. That's, the enemy thinks that's ridiculous. We can't write about that band because they're only playing to, what's three times 16? 48,000 people in the space of a week. You know, it's phenomenal. And that's what the enemy should be following. They should be keeping those bands. Uh, because, you know, it's not, I don't think Gary Lightbody's a boring person at all. He's got a fantastic indie pedigree. And again, that band struggled for years. And I think the story with their album was, you know, Final Straw was, it was well named, wasn't it? Because if this doesn't work, it's mm. never going to happen. Then Fiction finally took a punt on it. And now they're much richer than me. And I'm not obsessed about Coldplay although I've mentioned about 10 times already in this interview. But, you know, once you've done a Coldplay and a Keen, you do start to keep an eye out for those kind of bands. And I'm not, I'm not a big fan of that music. You know, I wasn't at the O2 watching Snow Patrol and a lot of those bands, especially subsequently, I didn't really like. But the problem was that because the majors were so late with Coldplay and Keen, they overcompensated. So any band that had a bit of a tune, like The Feeling or Star Sailor, they leapt upon straight away. And they missed the, those crucial six months. The crucial six months when the band could get played by Steve Lamack, you know, get a bit of evening session speciality play, do gigs here in Camden Falcon, the band weren't allowed to do that. They were sort of, you know, you're going to be massive. So they were kind of whooshed through the system. And it works up to a point. You can get, you can sell 60,000 albums, maybe even like 100,000 albums if you're lucky. But again, there's no foundation to it. And that's what we're seeing now in, in you know, to the power of 50. First on was Kaiser Chiefs and then it was Block Party, and then there was another band, we don't can't remember who they were, and then it was Razorlight. And it was, you know, five quid to get in. It was really busy, but none of them at that point were, no one knew who was gonna do well.